Welcome back to the Gun Shop Show. I'm your host, Eli Bruton. As you know, we like to have fun on this show. We don't take ourselves too seriously, but we do care deeply about our Second Amendment rights, and we're going to get into the nitty-gritty of the Second Amendment battle here in Missouri and the implications that it could have uh, nationally. Uh, But I want to remind you real quick, if you want to win a gun today, yes, we're giving away a gun on today's show Uh, All you have to do is share the feed and tag five friends in the comments. So if you're listening on the radio, you need to jump over to Facebook, type in Liberty Tree Guns. You're going to be able to see uh, all of the things uh, that we're describing here on the show, including this Behrman Derringer in 38 Special. We're giving that away to a viewer today. All you have to do is share the feed, tag five of your friends in the comments, and you're going to get entered to win that. We will draw the winner next show. We will also reveal the winner of last week's giveaway before the end of the show. So on the front lines of the battle for the Second Amendment is the Missouri legislature, and that is surrounding the Missouri Second Amendment Preservation Act, and we've got two... uh, Second Amendment advocates who are true boots on the ground in Representative Cody Smith, good friend of mine and friend of the show, and Representative Jared Taylor, who's a sponsor of this bill. They're joining us today on the Gun Shop Show. Thanks, folks, for uh, for joining us. Hey, guys. Great to be with you again. Thanks for having me. I'm proud to have my friend, Representative Jared Taylor, with us today from Christian County. And we're coming to you from my office in Jefferson City, where this week we have passed the Second Amendment Preservation Act out of the Missouri House and sent that over to the Missouri Senate. And so we're very proud to have done that. Jerry's been working on this for for years now. And uh, we've got the man himself today to talk about it and tell us tell us what it does or talk to you and your your audience about what 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 it is we're trying to accomplish with that bill. And so, Jared, I'll turn it over to you. um, And thanks again for having us. Thanks, Thanks guys. I so uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to be on the show and to explain a little bit about what we're doing in Jeff City and, and what we did this week. I mean, it was a, a monumental uh, task and, and something that uh, we have been working hard on for years. Uh, back in 2013, 2014, this passed out, the, out of the legislature. Um, it was over. It was vetoed by the governor. They attempted to override and missed the override by one vote. Uh, we brought it back three years ago. But in, in short, what we're doing is we're using the uh, tried and true tested anti-commandeering act saying that we are not going to use our local resources. We're not going to be commandeered by the federal government to enforce federal gun laws. Uh, we as Missourians uh, believe in our Second Amendment. We hold those rights uh, dear and sacred, and we want to protect those rights. We want to protect a uh, from an out of control federal government from coming in and taking those rights away from us, taking House Bill 120 seven was just introduced this week and what it does is it does all of the 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 pipe dreams that the democrats want it takes away ar-15s it makes uh, additional background checks it makes every gun owner in the united states go through a mental health exam current and future gun owners it uh adds new taxes to our ammunition it taxes those out of existence and so this bill would stop that from happening in Missouri. It, it says that we're not going to help you enforce those federal laws. Uh, by doing that, we're, we're asserting our state's rights and pushing back on the federal government uh, and, and in, in those encroachments. And just, you know, by, by telling our law enforcement, you know, we respect it so dear, our Second Amendment rights so dear that we don't want you help enforcing those laws and, and taking away uh, law abiding citizens guns. And so that's what we're doing. So uh, I think some of our listeners in our immediate area may take for granted just how good we have it in terms of our state legislature and gun rights and um, the ideal of the individual right to self-defense. That's one thing we break down a lot on the show is Missouri's Castle Doctrine and how it actually does a pretty good job of protecting your right to defend yourself. Um, The thing that is less in our control is what obviously gets passed at the federal level. And we know with uh, the recent election that that may be coming down the pike. But when people debate what's going to happen if there's gun bans and potential gun confiscation, it comes down to 
who's going to be sent to do that. And logistically, there has to be agencies down to the individual police officer or someone who would enforce those rules. So what your bill does is focuses on prohibiting that. So uh, can you say, can you give me some examples of, uh, I know that's the general premise, but uh, in what ways would your bill uh, prevent, w first of all, what agencies and then how would it limit um, their behavior? Sure. So the way that the federal government enforces any of its laws is it relies on the states to enforce those. It relies on our law enforcement to enforce those laws and to implement those laws. What this bill does is it tells our law enforcement, all law enforcement in the state of Missouri, actually any entity in the state of Missouri, that we will not use our resources to enforce your federal laws. It says to the, the cops on the street, you can no longer enforce federal laws. It tells our sheriff it tells our police chiefs you cannot force your guys in fact it's against the law but if this bill goes into effect uh it's against the law to enforce federal laws um so this this bill is just as much about protecting second amendment rights as it is the officer on the street because you're absolutely right there's going to be someone that has to go knock on these doors and, and take these guns and to enforce these laws our officers, I guarantee you don't want to be doing that. Um, our, we have some amazing law enforcement in the state of Missouri, and we want to protect them. We don't, we don't want them going and having to put their lives more at risk than what they already do by doing something that is, in my opinion, unconstitutional. Um, and I believe that's the opinion of, of most in Missouri. So this bill prohibits that from happening. Uh, in the enforcement mechanism, uh, we changed that a little bit. There was some concerns uh, for, by law enforcement. We heard those concerns. Uh, you know, I worked with, with Representative Cody Smith on this. I worked with the Speaker of the House um, on drafting an amendment, uh, figuring out how do, we, how do we listen to those concerns by law enforcement and then making adjustments to this bill to make it better. And what we did is rather than putting the um, the enforcement on the, the law enforcement officer or the penalty on the law enforcement officer, now we're putting that penalty on the department. Uh, we are saying that um, if you violate or if an individual violates someone's Second Amendment rights, if you violate the terms of, of SEPA, uh, then you as a department will be held responsible and the individual can bring suit. Uh, you lose your sovereign and qualified immunity as a department and you could be sued. The minimum penalty will be $50,000. So every time you violate someone's rights, every time you violate SAPA, it's a $50,000 penalty. Um, and and we, ho we will hold those departments accountable for violating uh, someone's Second Amendment rights. So we're coming up on a break. I want to give a couple of examples of uh, this uh, cooperation or lack thereof that takes place in the field that I saw with my own personal experience from my background in law enforcement uh, of how local law enforcement agencies are an extension uh, when there's a federal investigation. So we'll get into how that breaks down. We'll get into those penalties because I saw some letters from uh, various county sheriffs who were voicing op opposition and this is not uncommon uh, the concealed carry laws that were put into place their biggest opposition initially was uh, missouri's fraternal order of police so we'll continue this great discussion on the gun shop show hey y'all it's mel with pro outfitters once again i'm on the go but i always make time for the gun shop show Welcome back to the gun shop show. I want to remind you win a free gun right now. Well, you won't win it now, but you can enter to win it now by sharing the feed and tagging five friends. You do that by going to Facebook, tagging five of your friends in the comments of the live stream. I've got two great two A warriors on the line with us discussing the battle for the second amendment and just the nuts and bolts of that. It's one thing to say we support the second amendment. It's one thing to say, Oh, uh, cops would never confiscate guns. It's one thing to say, uh, you know, soldiers would never get involved in gun control. Having been uh, one of those police officers myself, it is true that there were standards that I have and I think that most people, most uh, 
police officers are well-intended, good people, although quite frankly, I met some that were not. So you can't trust just that every individual is not going to engage in some behavior that we would view on the gun shop show and our most of our listeners would view as un-American. Uh, but that being said, sometimes it's not that clear. You're given an assignment, your job is dependent upon it, and you have to think about your livelihood. There's uh, something you might not agree with, or you might think that uh, your instructions are, are not fair or clear, but this is your livelihood. This is your income. This is how you protect your family. This is may have been what you have gone to school to do. So just trusting that, oh, they'll never enforce that uh, makes it puts that individual in a very tough position. And what the Second Amendment Preservation Act that uh, we have the sponsor of the bill, uh, Jared Taylor, as well as a good friend of the show, uh, House Budget Chair Cody Smith, what you've done is is sort of preemptively defined. We're not going to put you in this position as an individual police officer. So um, some of the concerns raised by sheriffs were that we might punish or uh, fine the individual police officer. Is that correct? Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, their concern was where, you know, we, we could be putting these officers in a, um, you know, hurting them by placing the responsibility on them or the, the penalties on them. Um, and, and we heard those concerns. Uh, and so we changed those penalties and now it's going to be on the department. So, you know, if a department uh, or an individual in that department does violate these terms, then it'll be on the department. It'll, it'll, you know, impact, you know, their, uh, their bottom line. Uh, and, and that's, that's what we do up here at the state all the time is, you know, when someone is acting the, the incorrectly or that we believe, uh, inappropriately, the way that we impact them is by hitting their, their budget. And, and by us doing this, it, it's going to send a message to these departments that we don't want you to violate a person's right. We don't want you to, to violate second amendment rights in the state of Missouri. Uh, and we want them to think twice before they do that. It's pretty similar. Uh, you know, a story I tell a lot is uh, when when Governor Nixon abused the concealed carry database, um, there was there was some uh, investigation into a list of concealed carry holders. And that was another example where the legislature saw the governor's office was in charge of of this database because it was at the level of the Department of Revenue. And what they did was take that away, put it at the sheriff's level where we have more local control. And uh, it's kind of what you've done here in the f in the fact that if a federal agency goes to various counties, which constitutionally, this is the way it's supposed to work. You're, su you're supposed to have to go in and get permission from the highest law enforcement uh, official within that county and get permission or cooperation to, to act on anything. What that has allowed fr from the politics of that is now a sheriff can say, look, I can't do that. It would put my department in this position. So not only do I not want to do it and now gives them a little bit of teeth to why they can't. That's exactly right. You're, you're exactly right. This doesn't prevent them to be uh, being part of a task force. It doesn't prevent them from, from helping in the, the prosecution of drug charges or human trafficking or anything like that, but it does stop, stop them uh, from helping in the, prosecution of federal gun laws. Uh, and, and you're exactly right that this bill um, gives them teeth to say, no, I'm not going to help you. I can't, uh, according to state law. So not only do we have good Second Amendment sheriffs in the state who, who probably wouldn't do this, but we don't know what about the police chiefs and what about the guy after, you know, your current sheriff. Uh, so this is setting the, us up for, for uh, our future and for future generations in Missouri. That's why I always tell uh, concealed carry students, listeners on the show, the office of sheriff is such an important position because I, mean, I give the example all the time. How, how often do you see a sheriff's deputy on the side of the road writing speeding tickets versus a municipal agency? Because the sheriff has to answer to the voting public every four years uh, to, to get into office. 
And that's the thing. You said most of our sheriffs are pro Second Amendment. Most of the law enforcement officials that I met and and worked alongside were pro the individual owning guns. However, in the structure of especially municipal police officers, but even could be administration within the Missouri Highway Patrol, someone that doesn't believe like we do that comes possibly from uh, the East or West coast that is a qualified candidate in terms of their law enforcement career could get hired by any city or any municipality as their police chief and carry along with them politics that do not align with Missouri values. I mean, you can move here from California and become the chief of police in St. Louis or anywhere that is possible. This bill has helped make sure that the beliefs of Missourians are what the agencies are required to conform with. Yeah, you're exactly right. Uh, and I, I can't stress that enough. I mean, I think we best know what Missourians want as a state representative. You know, Cody and I both represent about the same number of people, 36,000 people. I think we have a pretty good pulse about what Missourians want and our Second Amendment rights rather than a, you know, a, a Nancy Pelosi that's out in California who's trying to enforce these federal gun laws, who wants something different, who her constituents want something different. They don't know what's going on in Missouri. They don't. They have no no idea what values we hold dear here in Missouri, um, but we do. And 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 at our responsibility to Missourians is to represent them in their interests. Um, and and Second Amendment rights are are a fundamental right, and and I believe that are core in here in Missouri. Uh, I'm so thankful to to have you guys on our side. Uh, so, But there are people that heard about this uh, act in its other attempts and I think became a little bit numb to thinking, oh, well, this is window dressing. They're, they're attempting to say, we're, we're trying, but it keeps getting defeated. But from what I gather, this thing is uh, now on the cusp. So give us the latest, um, you know, has it been voted on? What is the current status of the bill? Yeah, we voted on it this week. Uh, so we took the perfecting vote and there was 107 votes in favor and 43 opposed. It was on uh, party lines, unfortunately. Um, even though some of the Democrats agreed with, with what we were doing just in general, uh, it was party line vote. And then on Thursday, we, we third read it and passed it. So we passed it out of the House and it is moving over to the Senate. And that vote was 103 uh, to 43. So we were within two votes on Wednesday of having a veto proof majority and we had people out and that's why we didn't have that veto proof majority. But I think if those representatives were in their chairs, uh, we would have had that veto proof majority. We have 114 Republican members and they, and I, I believe they all would have voted in favor of this bill. So it's got a, it's got great momentum. We need, we still need the grassroots though. We still need you contacting, uh, your state Senator. That's where it's going next. Uh, and still encouraging your state representatives. Um, you know, I, We've got not I can't tell you guys enough uh, over in the, the Joplin area. Uh, we've got some amazing reps, uh, Dirk Deaton, Ben Baker, Cody Smith. I mean, phenomenal guys. Um, so but keep encouraging them. Keep keep showing your support for this bill and especially contact your your state senators to, to let them know. And, and we're coming up on a know, break. So when we come back, I want to break down what's going to happen in the Senate. Uh, you mentioned a veto-proof minority, so uh, majority. So we need to talk about the governor. We'll be right back on the Gun Shop Show. Listen here, Pilgrim. This here is the Gun Shop Show. All right, we're back on the Gun Shop Show. Supporting the Second Amendment, talking about the Second Amendment Preservation Act in Missouri, that this is the exact moment uh, that I wanted this show for. So we have a good time. We, t we show you behind the curtain of the gun shop and uh, what we do here day to day. And a lot of times we're just talking about guns and we make a point to not uh, spend a lot of time on politics in general. But when it really matters, when your Second Amendment rights are on the line, 
we're going to bring you the latest, the thing that is most pertinent to us here in Missouri, but has ripple effects, uh, implications, not only federally, but we've got some listeners all around the globe from from countries where their gun rights have already been restricted and they listen to us every week and they they write into us and tell us you can't give this up because we did and we can't get it back we try there there's groups that believe in the same things for the same reasons that we do here in america and they're in the minority and the political battle is too much they can't win back those rights so now is the time if you believe in the second amendment and you want to make a difference it's not good enough to go in the facebook comments and argue with people on politics it's not good enough to slap a thin blue line sticker on the back of your car and say that it matters to you what happens to law enforcement and it matters to you what happens with the second amendment if you're not ready to help out in this moment. And so when we went to break, we were talking with a sponsor of the House version of the Second Amendment Preservation Act, uh, Jared Taylor and House Budget Chair and good friend of mine in the show, Representative Cody Smith. Guys, uh, you were getting into what needs to happen next. So you were able to get a successful vote along party lines, two votes away from a veto proof uh, majority. So I have to ask if that is in the discussion, is there any rumblings that governor Parsons would, uh, veto this? So governor Parson was a state Senator back in 2013, 2014, as I discussed earlier, this bill moved back then. Uh, he was one of the supporting votes. Uh, I think that he will continue to spot or to, to uh, support this legislation. Uh, it was a very similar piece of legislation. As I told you earlier, we changed, uh, we had an amendment on the floor, so it, it, it's a little bit different, but I think it's actually uh, better for our law enforcement uh, and, and our law enforcement agreed with it. That's why we were able to get so many votes the other day. And, and so I just want to, you know, I, I think the governor is, is going to do the right thing. I think he's, he's, going to support this but but we can't take that for granted we've got to make calls to his office and we've we've got to ask we've got to know you know where he stands and and i would encourage to you know people to, to contact him respectfully and ask where he stands and ask him you know to make a public statement about it well uh, i want to get into that because correct me if i'm wrong governor parsons was a county sheriff for a time he was correct? Okay, so I, I want to read some uh, uh, some quotes that were uh, f from an article that were um, uh, protests, I would say, some exceptions taken with this bill by um, a couple of county sheriffs. And these may be prior to the changes you made, but I want to break them down and see, you know, what did they mean by these? Uh, and, and one of them is uh, sheriff are not. I'm not sure if that's Greene County or... Uh, yeah, that's the Greene County Sheriff. So Lewis County Sheriff David Parrish and uh, Greene County Sheriff Jim Arnott uh, had been involved in a letter that they sent to state reps to, to say that they had a problem with this bill. And uh, so it reads as such, we need state laws that will make it easier to keep our communities safe not those that have unintended consequences and silence law enforcement officials. So tell me is that prior to the changes you've made and and what were those arguments because if if our listeners and those of us that want this to to go the distance are going to have these discussions at the grassroots level we need to know what what were those concerns exactly and have those been to your knowledge alleviated yeah, so some of the concerns were alleviated. I, I, I'm not going to say that they all were, uh, but but yes, those letters were prior to the change that we made. Uh, they had concern that if you know if it passed the way that it was originally drafted, that they would have a hard time recruiting law enforcement and keeping law enforcement. So that's why we made that change. We we wanted to. We heard their their concerns and we fixed that issue. Uh, they still have other concerns. Um, one of those concerns is that, that they believe that they're not going to be able to work with federal task forces. Uh, in my opinion, they will. They're going to have to operate differently. 
uh, just like what they did whenever they they started when we made the change on asset forfeiture a couple years ago in Missouri. Task forces had to operate differently. They had to write those agreements differently. And I think that that's what they're going to have to do here. I completely agree that we need to make sure that we are enforcing Missouri law. Like I said, I think I know better than you know any Washington D.C. Uh, politician from California or even Texas. I know what better in Missouri. What's going on in Missouri? Um, so we 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 have to enforce Missouri law. We have a problem, I think, in Kansas City and St. Louis with our prosecutors not prosecuting and letting these guys and 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 women out early when we they need to stay in jail and but that's a problem with missouri law and how and we've got to decide that as a state we shouldn't leave it up to the feds to decide how long our criminals are put away or or whatever let's figure that out as a state and i support law enforcement when it comes to truth and sentencing and and if we need to add additional time or make sure that they they stay in in longer for certain uh penalty or uh certain crimes that they commit. So I'm I'm in all support of that. And, and we've got to figure that out as a state. But this bill doesn't have anything to do with that. This bill deals with the Second Amendment and protecting the rights of Missourians. So uh, the argument might be made uh, that your people use the, the terminology nullifying federal law. It's you're you are not, at least in this instance, um, claiming the authority to say that that's not illegal on the federal level you're just defining the fact that you you're not going to have missouri resources allocated toward enforcing things that violate the second amendment and this is strictly we're strictly talking about local law enforcement this doesn't affect the national guard at all correct that's right so it, well it's all missouri resources um so and I, and I think that's a great point that you brought up. Um, yeah, we're not telling the feds, we're not, we're not violating the supremacy clause by telling the feds what they can and can't enforce in Missouri. We're not doing that. What we're saying is we're not going to use our resources to help you. The, the way the feds implement their law is by using us to do it. They don't have the resources. They don't have the manpower to implement federal law. And they're certainly not going to be able to do that when it comes to millions of law abiding gun owners and, and guns in Missouri. They're going to require or need our assistance. And we're going to say, no, we're, we're not helping you in, enforce an AR-15 ban or an ammo capacity ban. Uh, we're not going to help with that. Uh, so that you're exactly right. And I want to make sure people understand. We're not saying that that, that federal law is going to be voided in Missouri or nullified in Missouri or that the feds can't enforce it. We're just saying we're not going to help you do that. Which is uh, flexing the muscle that you do have. We, we wish that the national politics uh, weren't in the condition that they are, that the we weren't at risk of seeing these types of bans, but we've had widespread gun control legislation at the national level before. So what this is, is a real world uh, flexing of our uh, state's rights uh, that you guys uh, have been boots on the ground, and I know putting in a, a ton of work on. So in the time we, we have left, I want to talk about, uh, I want to ask you, uh, Cody, what do you view as what we need to do if we're going to go to work and what else uh, do you need help with on anything um, conservative value wise or in the legislature? Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for having us on today. This is very helpful to help us get the message out about what we're working on here in Jefferson city to address the concerns of second amendment advocates uh, in the state. Um, that are concerned about bad gun laws coming out of Washington, D.C. This is a way that the Missouri legislature is pushing back against that, that threat. And, uh, and so where we need to go from here is for uh, the advocacy folks, the grassroots folks, to turn their attention to the Missouri Senate. Uh, we passed this out of the Missouri House. Now we'll go to the Missouri Senate. And it, it's helpful for you to call your senators, to write your, sen your state senators, advocate for them to pick this bill up and pass it and send it to the governor's desk. They can go to the Senate website to find that contact information for their, their respective state senators. That is senate.mo.gov and uh, senate.mo.gov. And that will tell them who their state senator is. They can find out there. They can find out how to contact them. Call them, write them, say, hey, please pick this bill up and pass it. It's very important uh, to, the, to the gun owners in the state. 
From there, if we get it through the Senate, uh, we will go on to, the, to Governor Parson's desk. Uh, like Jared said, Governor Parson has a long record of supporting the Second Amendment. I believe that he will sign this bill, uh, but we've got to get it to his desk first. So right now, the game is in the Missouri Senate, and that's where we should shift our focus. Uh, you've got strong Second Amendment support in the, in the House, Missouri House. You do have that in the Senate as well. Uh, but right now, the, the, the light is shining on them to pick up the bill and pass it. Okay. Uh, we appreciate you. We're running out of time. I can't thank you enough for the work that you've been doing and uh, the instructions because, trust me, our listeners, they want those marching orders. We'll put a link to uh, the Senate website uh, with that contact information so you can go to work right now to fight for the Second Amendment. This has been the Gun Shop Show. Stay with us. Previous episodes and more available at gunshopshow.com.